Afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Liberal Democrats live stream. Given that it was such a uh, momentous week in state politics, we thought it'd be good to get David and Tim here just to give you background about what happened this week and, and their views about um, uh, what people can do next and, um, you know, where things sit now. My name's uh, Ash Blackwell. I work in David Limbrick's office. Um, I'll just be moderating today and maybe taking some questions towards the end. If you've been here for some of our live streams before, we've, we've kind of got right into the Q&A, but today we just want to have a, a brief rundown and review of the week and, and take a few questions. So um, about six months ago, the Premier declared a state of emergency uh, related to the coronavirus on the 16th of March. That was due to expire on the 13th of September. And over the last couple of weeks, we've had this sort of flurry of activity um, related to that. So um, we'll go a little bit over the process, but first of all, uh, it's been a big week. David, how are you feeling? Oh, look, I am a bit uh, worn out, but uh, I feel like we did the right thing. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we did everything that we could to oppose this. So we really went all out on this. Um, we've worked crazy hours this week. I can't, I think I could count the number of hours I've slept on my hands. But um, yeah, we did the right thing, I think. How about you, Tim? Yeah, it's been a big, big week. Um, we had a late, a lot of late nights. So Tuesday night, when they're actually in Parliament, we didn't get the, the bill didn't pass until after two o'clock in the morning, um, which is not the absolute latest night we've had, but it's close. Um, and then we were back straight back into Parliament again at, at nine thirty the next morning. Um, but yeah, there was uh, it, emails went crazy. We had thousands and thousands of emails. Phones have been ringing off the hook. Um, people contacting us everywhere. Everything kicked up a gear or two, or two gears even this week. So it's it's been exhausting and I'm looking forward to having a beer this afternoon. I've never seen anything like it this week. The phone's just been running off the hook all week. Um, yeah, like Tim said, thousands and thousands of emails and messages on Facebook. And, you know, thank you to everyone um, who's contacted us because, um, you know, it, it, there's been just such some really both ends of the spectrum, right? There's been some really awful stories that people have told us about their personal stories. And that's been, you know, that's been um, good to hear that the, the real impacts of these lockdowns and, and, the, and the state of emergency on people's lives. But as well, you know, people have been telling us, you know, keep fighting, do the right, you know, you're doing the right thing and stuff. And that's been really encouraging for us. So, you know, you've really made an impact, I think, the people that have contacted us. So thank you. It was interesting too that um, of all the email, normally you get an email campaign, you get hundreds of identical emails coming in, but in this case, 70% or more were individual emails. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's yeah. quite astounding. Like, it's very clear that, you know, we've seen a number of campaigns and, you know, people trying to lobby MPs, but it's quite clear that, you know, a very large number, I don't know what proportion, but a very large number of the people that were contacting us were not, you know, experienced political activists or anything like that. They were just normal, everyday people who were upset and wanted their voice heard. And it was very obvious to me that that was the case in, in you know, of course we had some template email things as well, but it's very clear that there's some, you know, most of these contacts to my mind seem like real people with real issues and real concerns. And um, that was, that was good to know that people are so engaged in this. Uh, we will get to um, some of your questions uh, a bit later on. So feel, feel free to put them up there. I've got my eye on both David and Tim's pages so I can keep an eye on any comments or questions you've got there. Um, so let's walk back a little bit. It was the 23rd of August, a couple of weeks ago now, that it was announced in the media that the government would be seeking a to, to amend the Public Health and Wellbeing Act to extend the restriction on the emergency powers out to 18 months, which would have um, given them the powers to declare a state of emergency up until September uh, next year. What happened then, David? Um. Well, that was the first we heard of it. 
uh, of course we knew it was coming we because we knew that the powers ended after six months and we were thinking, you know, what's the government going to do next because they haven't actually got a plan or anything yet. Um, so we tried to figure out all the scenarios. Then the next thing that happened after we, we got a, we actually, I got a phone call. I'm not sure if Tim got a phone call, but I got a phone call like a few minutes before the media release saying, oh, we're going to seek to extend the emergency powers and there's going to be a briefing in the afternoon. So we got a briefing in the afternoon uh, on that Monday afternoon, the briefing. A, a briefing. Yeah, it was so brief that we didn't even have a copy of the bill um, or even the draft exposure of it. It was just some of their advisors were talking to us. And, you know, this is typical of the way that they've been treating us. Uh, and, yeah, and then later that night, they sent us through uh, an actual draft exposure of the bill. But, I mean, yeah, it was pretty pretty poor engagement from my point of view, considering that they had six months to deal with this. Yeah, and, and what was your take on it? Well, first of the six-month thing, um, they're not supposed to extend the powers. The whole point of the six months was you have six months to do something different. You have, if there's an emergency, you can act on it with, your, with the emergency powers and get stuff in place. If there needs to be a re legislative response, or we'll write some laws and do it. Um, instead, the government just they, coasting along on these emergency powers where they can do what they want kick the parliament out and let us, come, let us come back and then they come to the end of the six months and say, let's have more of this. Um, it's not how it's supposed to work. Um, the briefing we got was was a was nonsense. So the briefers didn't know the answer to the questions. They didn't know what was going on. Um, they were sneering at our concerns that people were going to be upset about this. Um, they, I think they genu genuinely thought that the population of Victoria was going to go, yeah, let's have 12 more months of this. Um, the other thing they did was going to be um, it wasn't just going to be twelve more months of this. It was going to be twelve. It was going to be eighteen months for every uh, state of emergency that they declared. So anyway, it was rubbish. Um, perhaps yeah. surprisingly, it didn't go quite as well as they were expecting. Yeah, I mean, to us, it just seemed crazy that they'd come in and ask for twelve months like this. I mean, did they really think the Victorian people and the crossbench are just going to say, "Yeah, no worries, here you go. Here's you know." all this power for another 12 months. Like, it's just crazy. I mean, to my mind, you know, when the, when the emergency powers first came in, Tim and I had a very long discussion about it, about what we think. You know, they didn't need Parliament to approve them using the emergency powers, but we said, you know, all right, you've got these powers. It is an emergency, so we won't get in the way, we'll, we'll, but we'll watch what you do very closely. And here's us, I feel stupid now, thinking that they were going to do it. But here's us thinking that, all right, well, they're going to have to come up with these plans during the six months to deal with the pandemic that, you know, are compatible with a free society. And, you know, we thought, you know, if they need specific uh, you know, new regulations or legislation or something that they bring that in, you know, they did bring in an omnibus bill earlier to, to do some things around courts and parliamentary committees and things like this. But... Um, they haven't really done anything. Like, they've still got no plan. We're going to see the plan, you know, next Sunday. And mm -hmm. there's no... No one really knows what the end game is. It's it's just been terrible, like, the way that they've managed it. And then they come back and ask for another year. And, like, Tim and I are like, no way. Like, we're not going to support that. Mm. Perhaps, so, unusually, the uh, rest of the cross bench jacked up too. So, this yeah. is, this, the government's had... Up until now, they've had a pretty easy run... With getting things through the parliament, they've always been able to find um, people to drop in, fall in line. Um, this was almost the first pushback they've had, where initially the entire crossbench said no. Um, yeah, I mean, and and a lot of that is due to you know the the people that have been contacting them. You know, like you guys out there who have been calling people up and saying, "I don't want you to do this," like you know, especially independent crossbenchers, they, they have to listen to that at least, you know, at least acknowledge that it exists. It's, um, you know, I think it's it's been, you know, although the bill still passed, I think the government's heard loud and clear that there is some level of dissent on this. Um, although, I don't know, like, Tim and I probably disagree on this. I, I, I feel like the, the 12 months extension was just an ambit claim and they pretty much got in the end what they wanted. But I think Tim's got a different view on this. Uh, 
and I said it um, before, I think the uh, government, they've been living in a, in a bubble. They've had, um, they're surrounded by their advisors and the, the bureaucratic, the health experts and everyone telling them you're doing a great job, you're saving Victoria, you're saving lives, um, everyone loves you. Um, they're not. And they, these people will have public service jobs and pay and, and everything's secure. Um, and they think the whole of Victoria is going, yeah, you're doing a great job, keep going. Um, and I feel like this, they, they with a little, an experience of rubber hit the road for a minute here when they tried to bring this in. Um, I think they genuinely thought that they'd get 12 months waived through no problems. Um, and mm. so it was a shock to them that it didn't happen that way. Um, they're still very out, they're still very much out of touch, don't get me wrong, but they've, they've just had a little brief tap of reality and they're probably going to get a bit more. Mm. Mm. Do you think that um, the people calling their offices and sending those emails made a difference um, across other members of the crossbench? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, I mean, you, the, the, especially when they're real stories, you know, people, people talking about their businesses that have failed, um, their children that, you know, are having trouble with school now. I, mean, we, I, I outlined a lot of these in the speech that I gave, and, and they're really harrowing stories, a lot of these things. You know, people don't make this stuff up. This is, this is real pain that people are feeling. And, um, you know, to just, to just dismiss that, or the fact that the government didn't even really, you know, seem to know how much pain is out there. I mean, they're just so out of touch. They're calling, so they're calling people who are complaining about it, the crackpots, um, sovereign citizens, QAnon, whatever. They're just saying the only people who are upset about this are this tiny minority, when in fact it's 20% of the population are yelling about it. Um, I, anyway, I think it, it certainly firmed up the backbone in a number of the crossbenchers. I think in the initial um, discussion, there was probably some of them could have been swayed, but the wave of, of emails and, and messages they got from everyone in the community really put some backbone in there for most of them. Yeah. For most of them. So the the government went back to the crossbench to negotiate a deal. So we had a, a week of the phones melting down and, and the emails kind of flying around. And then it was um, the next Monday before Parliament was sitting that, um, you know, they kind of announced what their plan is. Can, can you run us through the process between when you found out about what their plan is and when it was introduced into the chamber on the Tuesday? Well, we didn't actually see the final bill until, I mean, the final bill we got on the morning it was debated, wasn't it? Like the very final yeah. version, like, which is just ridiculous. And then the Libs brought up the very good point. So there's a committee called uh, Scrutiny of Acts and Regulations Committee and bills are meant to sort of go through this uh, process to make sure that they're compatible with other acts and regulations and this sort of thing. And it hadn't actually gone through that process. And so they did this crazy thing where in the morning of this Tuesday, they referred it to this committee and the committee met at lunchtime to discuss it. And the committee came up with a report and said, oh, we don't have enough time. We'll give you the report after the legislation's passed. I'm like, are you crazy? Like, this is just a shambles. Like... It was just a joke, really. I mean, I can't believe that they that they did it this way. I mean, they're just so unorganised. It's crazy. Yeah, um, it's the, the, we got the draft, so we got drafts of the bill thing, but it, the actual final bill just came in the morning. We're sitting in Parliament when they actually now we've dropped it. Here's a final version you can all have a look at. Um, yeah, the people have been drafting amendments to it, but they had. A, amendments to the draft bill. So then they had to go back and redraft their amendments to match what we finally got. Um, it was a mess. Um, but I guess the government, knowing they had their numbers, weren't too fast. Uh, we didn't know they had the number. We didn't know where the numbers were coming from. Um, yeah, we, we were trying to figure all, it out. We spent the whole week trying to... They were in the, in the media last week saying they had four votes on the crossbench. And we were trying to do, do the math and we couldn't figure out where they could get four votes from. Um, we got two. Um, that's all we could figure out. Um, and it turns out um, they had those two and then they, they roped in uh, Samantha Ratnam from the Greens, uh, who's on maternity leave, not supposed to be back until October. So they reeled her in for a vote at the last minute 
which gave them three votes, which was just enough to get it across the line in 2019. Um, but certainly uh, we spent the last few days we were before the vote uh, talking, lobbying the crossbenchers, trying to work out who was who was lying to us. They're all saying they're not going to vote for it. Um, it was an interesting process. Um, some of them cover themselves with glory. Um, I'm a, I've always been a, a bit of a fan of Catherine Cummings, but um, she was a very much a honey badger on this. She told the government in those no uncertain terms that she wasn't having any of it. Um, so. so, do you want to maybe uh, run us through the debate in the chamber? How, how did the how did it go? Any sort of standout contributions from your colleagues? Um, your opinion of the the government's uh, you know. Um, contribution to debate and um, then what happened with the, the committee stage? Because it was a little bit unusual there as well. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I was the first uh, crossbencher to speak on the bill in the morning. I just thought, I'll, I'll just go first. And so I came in and went first on that. And, um, you know, I just, what I did with the speech, you know, the speech only went for eight minutes and it, and it got biggest reaction I've ever seen on any speech that I've ever done. I mean, crazy, crazy um, popularity. But, um, you know, the, the way that we put that together, you know, it's a short thing, but a lot of team effort goes into that. So the stories that I told, they were real stories from my staff who'd been on the phone and, you know, I'd been on the phone too and putting together some of these stories and and putting together some ideas that I'd had and things that I'd put together in committee and that and we sort of put that all together into a speech and I thought it was really important to reflect back the pain that people were feeling and I think that's what people um, maybe resonated with is is the pain and and also the 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 crazy nature of the government's response in in lots of ways, like these moral trade-offs, which is something that I've been um, very outspoken about and very concerned about. I don't think that they're really accounting for all the harms. You know, a lot of the other speech, the Libs um, put in some good efforts. I mean, maybe Tim can talk about Catherine Cummings' effort. I mean, she was she really stood up to the government. You know, she's an independent. I mean, what did you have to say about that? You're a big fan, Tim. Mm -hmm. Um. Catherine is a she's an interesting MP. Uh, she often says exactly what she's thinking. Um, thoughts to the mouth happening. Um, a lot of the people in the in the parliament look down on her. Um, she, they think she's not not too bright or something because um, she's from the western suburbs or something. Anyway, um, I have a lot of respect for Catherine. She's had twenty two years in local government before becoming an MP um, since as a mayor. She's actually pretty politically cluey. She can figure out what's going on in the parliament when no one else knows what's going on. She understands how, how and why people are voting. She's just not polished. Um, and she can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Um, but uh, I'm very impressed with her. And um, she stood up to the government the whole time with this. Um, I don't know who else had good speeches. Rod was a, a bit emotional, but clear why he couldn't vote for it. Um, who else? Cliff. The Hinch Cliff. Justice guys voted against it. That was yeah. good. I mean, early on, Darren Hinch said that he'd support the government and clearly there must have been some uh, disagreement within their party about that because they later came out and changed their position. Um, maybe Darren Hinch didn't get the memo of how how white hot people were with rage about this. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was great to see... Um, yeah, but I mean, the Greens were silent the whole time, so they didn't even give a speech on it. They probably did today in the lower house uh, or yesterday in the lower house, but um, there was nothing yeah. on Facebook, nothing at all. Um, no, there was nothing, zero. So yeah. you know, it, yeah. I mean, I know that Animal Justice and uh, Reason Party, at least they stated publicly their position, which you know wasn't popular, but at least they had the honesty to do that. But the Greens just didn't say anything. They just were silent, totally silent about it, which is, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty disappointing. Yeah. And what's the response been like? Um, well, actually, I don't know if we got into the committee yeah. stage yet. So what, what happened? 
maybe explain what the process is so that just for people who don't understand the, the normal process for passing legislation, um, a, a little bit about how, how the formal process works and then what happened during the committee stage of debate. Yeah. Uh, did you want to go first, Tim? Oh, I'll, I'll let you do it. But um, we have they have a first reading, which is not a reading at all. They just say, here is the bill. Then they have the second reading debate where um, the minister makes a, a speech and then all the MPs get up and stand, say what they want to say, if they want to speak on it. Um, and then they have a vote on the second reading vote where a bill can be killed at that point. Um, if, it, if it passes the second reading vote, it goes into committee. And that's when they examine the bill clause by clause. Um, they ask questions about the bill as a whole and, and about each individual part of it. It's also where um, amendments get put up. If, if you're trying to amend an individual clause. Um, so it's, it's a way to interrogate the legislation and um, try to nail down what it's actually doing and what setting committee can be useful. It's when courts try to interpret the law, they, they look at what was said in the committee debate and um, that helps them decide what the law says. Yeah, and I, I was um, very well prepared for committee. I had lots and lots and lots of questions, um, you know, questions that I'd come up with from w work that I'd done on the Public Accounts and Estimates Committee, but also questions that people had asked me um, that had come into my office, questions that my staff thought up. And, you know, I had pages and pages of preparation, but the government didn't want the bait to go on all night. Um, it still went till two in the morning, but uh, they did something quite outrageous that I've never seen before. They used a special uh, procedure in the standing orders um, where if at least six of the six members stand up, they can force a vote. So debate gets cut off and they force a vote. So they gave us a bit of a go. At, so the minister has to sit at the table, has to stand at the table um, during the committee stage and everyone gets to go at have a go at asking questions and they sort of gave us a bit of a go asking her questions and then the government said all right you've had your fun and then they just gagged us basically and you know it was pretty outrageous when you see all the government just stand up and just stop uh questions about the bill i mean it makes me wild just thinking about it i mean this is one of the most important bills in victorian history massive massive public response to it and there's lots of legitimate questions i feel i truly feel that I wasn't trying to filibuster or anything. I had legitimate questions about the bill that I wanted answered. And, you know, I tried my best in the time that I had. But, I mean, it's just outrageous that they stopped it like this. So you've got the government putting in emergency powers and people, they're saying, we're not dictators. You're all crazy conspiracy theorists to suggest that. But we're going to, use, we're going to ram this through the parliament without proper debate um, just to get it through um, and then... What they do with the powers afterwards, anyway. Yeah, I mean, when I when I got cut off from questioning, I was only just getting started, and um, you know, it, you know, they could have thought that it was like some filibuster attempt or whatever. But I mean, my questions were legitimate, and I stand by it. So, you know, if if they want to stop me asking questions in Parliament, well, you know, I'll ask them in public. There's a, there's a fair bit there, um, people wanting to know what they can do next and, and things like that. And we will get to them in a minute, um, just to kind of round off this review of the week. What's the feedback been like since the bill passed the upper house um, Wednesday morning? I think there's been a mix of um, depression. A lot, of, a lot of people are very upset and angry about it. Um, a lot of people thanking us for what we've done, but um, what we've done didn't work. Um, we fought it. Um, and a lot of people wondering what the hell is going to happen next. Where do we go? Um, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I mean, we've had... Um, the phone still hasn't stopped ringing. I mean, even just now it was ringing. Um, and the emails and messages still haven't stopped. Um, we've had, you know, a lot of people thanking us, um, happy that we took a strong stand against this. Uh, and, you know, I feel like we did the right thing. And, you know, I'm re very happy to hear such positive feedback in what we've done. Um, you know, I feel like we took a principled stand and people uh, are recognising that. And I'm very happy about that, that, that they're happy with what we did. 
but you know understandably like tim says there's pe people are upset that we lost i think there were some people that um you know thought that there was a decent chance that we could beat it i never thought that we could defeat the government on this but i do feel like there was some compromises made that wouldn't have maybe been made if we hadn't have fought hard and i do feel like the government has heard now that um to some degree that you know it, they can't just do this so easily and that there is a group of people out there that are really upset about what's happening um so maybe a place to start to address some of the comments and questions uh coming through on on facebook um regarding the protest tomorrow um, so maybe let's start with that. Um, what are your views about the, the protest? A lot of people expressing that they're concerned about the protest. They're concerned about the police powers in general, and they're concerned about human rights and the ongoing impact to human rights. I mean, Tim and I are absolutely concerned about those things too. I mean, I'm very concerned about the infringements on human rights caused by these emergency powers. Um, I'm concerned... Uh, you know, we've all seen in the news about these people that have organised protests on, you know, they've just set up an event on Facebook and the police come knocking on their door and arrest them. I mean, it's Smashing totally outrageous. Down. Yeah, or knock your door down. I mean, it's totally outrageous what's happening. Um, that said, um, I'm very conscious of the fact I don't want people getting hurt. I don't want people getting arrested and fined. Um and uh, so that's that's why um, you know we were thinking about what we can do to provide some sort of outlet for people, and that's why I put together the um, I, I uh, have put to, I sent out an open letter today about um, curfew noise. So it's a type of protest that people can do at home, 8 p.m. tomorrow night. Um, just stand on your porch or whatever and make noise at 8 p.m. And I'd love as many Victorians to do that as possible. Um, I've already put it out on social media. Um, hopefully the mainstream media will pick it up. Um, it's a way, you know, to let off a bit of steam, I think, in a legal and safe way that people aren't going to get arrested or, 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 or fined by the police or something. Um, but, yeah, it is very concerning, you know, of course, we support people's right to freedom of assembly, right? Um, but, I, you know, we don't want people getting hurt. I'm, look, I'm not going to be out protesting tomorrow and it, I can't stand up and encourage people to go out there and protest when, um, one, there is a, there is a COVID risk, um, whatever we think of the disease. It is, it is real and people, if it spreads... Um, then people could die and we could be stuck in this lockdown for longer because the government will just use it as an excuse to lock us, keep us locked down. But two, the fact that if, if I'm not out there protesting, I'm, I'm hardly the one to stand up and say, yeah, you go out, you get a $20,000 fine um, for doing it. Um, mm. I get filled, I'm filled with fury when I see the police arresting people for posting things on Facebook, uh, for exercising their rights. Um, but I can't in all good conscience stand up and say, yes, go out and protest. Mm. I, I feel the same way. So I think that the, the, the curfew noise thing is like a good, uh, you know, compromise maybe. But, you know, I'm excited about it. I'm hoping that we'll, you know, make the noise. I, I have this dream of the whole city ringing with pots and pans. We'll wait and see whether that turns out or not. But look, I, you know, people have to do something, right? So... The other thing that I'm really concerned about is the government has been hell-bent on demonising anyone that questions their authority. Uh, they, they've just been, like Tim said, they've just been smearing them as uh, insane or conspiracy theorists or morally reprehensible people. And I'm very concerned that if people do go out there and, and you know, they're not well organised and they cause trouble tomorrow, that the government will just um, use this in the media to demonise further and come up with more authoritarian uh measures and it'll be really counterproductive i feel so um uh, to be fair whatever happens tomorrow they're going to use it against the protesters if if there's a very small protest they're going to say ha oh, we have complete control yeah. if um there's a big protest they'll say these evil people are keeping us locked up for longer yeah um, either way it's 
yeah, either way, it's not good. Um, but, you know, I think we just have to, we have to accept the fact that this is going to be a um, extended uh, fight here. It's not something that's going to be solved this weekend. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, that's the case. But uh, I think that we have to accept that and think, think uh, carefully and rationally about what we do and the consequences that it might have. And we've been thinking very carefully about that. And we're trying to make sure that we're not doing things that are going to be counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve. So there's lots of comments there as well. People, people want Dan Andrews sacked. They, they want the government held accountable. Um, lots of questions about, you know, what you can do. So, you know, what can you do and what can't you do and, and what actions are there available you know, within our parliamentary democracy to hold the government accountable. Okay, so, you know, with regards to, you know, there's lots of people saying sack the government and stuff like this. We haven't called for ministers to resign and the government to be sacked or whatever because it's just not realistic. Um, and, you know, if you're going to sack a government, like a minister, if a minister or a premier is going to resign, you know, who are you going to replace them with? And I don't know, like... It's, it's just not, I don't think it's a realistic thing. Um, as far as accountability is concerned, I mean, Parliament is still sitting, so we will have some accountability through Parliament. The um, uh, Parliamentary Accounts and Estimates Committee that I'm on, um, we do have an inquiry into the government's response into the pandemic at the moment. So we've been asking lots of questions about that, about their response and getting some answers, not as many as I'd like. The committee's still controlled by the government. So, you know, that's not great, but um, we can still do that. Um, there are still some uh, things that we can do in, in the form of, you know, protest like, like the, you know, making noise at curfew and the things like this. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're still trying to formulate as well you know, other actions that we're planning next. So we'll, I think stay tuned is the answer. We don't even know if the government will have the parliament back again next week. I mean, we're supposed to sit... Um, not next week, the week after, but yeah, we always say next week. Um, but now they've got the legislation through, they might decide that they can suspend the parliament again for another six months. Um, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But the, the presumption at this stage is that parliament will be back in a fortnight. But, um, you know, that may or may not happen. I don't know. Um, yeah, it'll be disappointing if it doesn't. So there's another comment here that I think kind of reflects a, a few of the comments and it's around data um, and the fact that um, decisions are being made based on, you know, data that isn't transparent and available to the public. So I know this is something you've done some um, work on through Pay Act, David. Do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, so one, one good compromise that um, this bill did end up getting is that the advice... Uh, that the that the health minister is receiving is going to be published. So that's a good thing. Um, but the the problem we all along really has been that they've got all these sort of secretive uh, ways of coming up with these things, and they keep saying, "Oh, it's all based on the science, and it's all based on the evidence, and all this sort of stuff." But what I discovered during PAYAC. Uh, that's the Parliamentary Accounts and Estimates Committee, what I discovered is that, you know, a lot of these things are not really based on science at all. Like, um, give you a good example. I was asking about, you know, why was fishing banned, right? Fishing something that you go out and do by yourself and, you know, like it doesn't seem like a high-risk activity. And I was asking, you know, what's the modelling on this? And what it turns out is that individual activities, they can't actually do risk modelling and assessments on those so they rely on a part in the legislation which falls on the precautionary principle. So what that means is that, you know, we don't really have all the scientific evidence available, but we'll just ban it anyway just to be safe, right? That's sort of the way they're doing it. And that's not basing anything on science. That's just, that's just saying, well, we're being very conservative about this, so we're going to institute these very restrictive rules. And there's been lots and lots of um, directions that they've come up with that I suspect are done exactly that way. And... The other thing with the data is that they've really got this one-dimensional focus on everything. You know, they're looking at the, the at the at the community transmissions and the and the infection rates and the 
and the deaths from the disease. But what they're not monitoring, as far as I can tell, and I don't see any evidence, despite massive amounts of questions from me and others, is modeling of the long term harms that they're causing. And this is just um, unacceptable to me. Like, how do they even justify what they're doing if they don't know the long term harms? And they've made these horrific uh, moral calculations on this. And the one that I've talked about the most is um, schools. So what we've discovered is that schools were not shut down to save children because the schools the, and the government openly says this, this is not me making it up. Um, they've, they've said this, uh, I've, there's a video with the education minister on my Facebook page that you can watch if you're interested. They said, the reason that we shut down schools, that schools were always safe. They were safe uh, earlier, they're safe now for kids, there's no problem. The reason that they've shut them down is to uh, reduce overall community activity, all right? Now, think about what that means. That means that they've sacrificed the well-being of children for some unquantified goal and unquantified harms. I mean, and this is the thing I've brought up many times, like they, they're sacrificing the well-being of an entire generation of children and we haven't even had a debate about it. I mean, what sort of society does this? It's, it's absolutely outrageous. I mean, there's no way we were going to support an extension to this sort of power. Anything uh, you want to comment on on that, Tim? Uh, it, it's it's David pretty much covered it all. Um, it's what they've done is not based on science. There's no, there's no evidence behind it. There's no modelling. Um, they've just done. Oh yeah, this feels like it'd be right. Um, or oh, this is this is shock and awe. If we, if we hit them hard enough with this, it'll scare everyone enough to get the results we're after. Um, they're supposed to go for the minimum necessary uh, impact, but they've, in every possible opportunity, they've gone for the maximum, whatever we can do that has the most impact on people's lives. Um, yeah, I mean, who believes, who believes that they've taken the least restrictive measures to control this? Like, does anyone? Um, well, we saw that uh, in the committee on Tuesday night. Um, the minister's going, why, why would I? She has, it's not even, hasn't even been issued. They weren't, she's not even aware of that they were supposed to be doing that way. Um, she couldn't answer the question because because they hadn't even considered it. Um, mm. Honestly, it was uh, I mean, that, amazing. That, yeah, it, it was quite stunning, actually. That was one of the things that I asked her in committee stage is how do you, I asked the minister this, how do you have assurance that, um, you know, the measures being applied are the least restrictive and that they're, you know, and that they're proportionate? And there was no evidence of assurance at all. It was just like, oh, well, you know, because the chief health officer told me so, I mean, they've just totally outsourced their morality. It's it's just wrong. Like, I mean, it seems like the minister's role at the moment is to do whatever the chief health officer says and then go and come out with these packages. They call them packages, you know, chunks of money to try and throw at the problems to try and clean up. But of course, you know, they're not going to fix these problems by throwing money at it. Mm. Some uh, questions about... Um... Do you guys think that Parliament will be back sitting on something approximating a regular schedule now that um, we've kind of returned so the government can pass their legislation? If I have to guess, I'd say yes. Um, but uh, I don't know for sure. Um, I've been guessing poorly so far about whether we're going to sit or not. I think I've got it wrong most of the time. I've been saying earlier on, I was saying we'll sit, we'll sit, and we never did. And then the last couple of sittings I've been saying, ah, oh, they'll postpone it, they'll postpone it, and they, they brought us back. Um, obviously, this one, they had to sit because their time had run out. Um, so we will see. Um, I guess they'll start sitting again properly now that they've got, all, they have us all spaced out in the chamber. So um, previ the previous sittings they had us in the, upper, in the lower galleries as well, but now they've turned the upper galleries into part of the parliament as well. So everyone, oh, we're up in the high country I was saying, <laughs> well, well above everyone else. Well, one good thing is when I saw Tim on camera on the on the television, he was up high because he's a regional member and I was down low, which is actually really hard for us because we communicate with each other all the time. And we had to use our phones and stuff to communicate, which was really painful. But the the parliament um, plaster work and stuff is really beautiful up the top. And like when I saw Tim, he looked like he was like a king or something up there. It was, magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite, quite quite good but um yeah it's it's quite difficult to communicate like that 
I was saying to David, we need to bring in uh, a speaking tube or something like a run down <laughs> over the balcony so we can have a chat. Some cans on screen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, lots of comments there about um, these alternative treatment options that a lot of people have been reading about. Um, and, and one there that could maybe cover you know, a bit of, bit of ground, basically, are you guys pro-choice for vaccines? And if you've got any comments about these um, alternative treatments, hydro hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, vitamin D, these kinds of things. Yeah. So look, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm not, I have no medical expert, no training. Um, I, I've read as interestedly as many people have of different things and people proposing ideas. Um, I am not in a position to say that we must do this, we should do that. Um, I think um, we should be trialling um, these drugs and there are trials underway, um, but I can't, I, I, I don't have the knowledge to stand up and say that's what we must be doing. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation running around as well. Uh, they, we've taken the... Uh, two sides stuff fighting with the last 20 years we've been fighting about climate change or whatever else we've suddenly applied this to COVID-19 we have two passionate sides making up misinformation feeding it out to argue for positions which there's no science involved in any of that um so I can't tell you what drugs will work I need to rely on doctors to tell that the government is conducting trials there things are happening in, into ivermectin and whatever else um so yeah with vaccines um I am pro-choice, I think. So I'm I'm a big fan of vaccines. Um, I, I like to make that point at the very start when I talk about vaccines. I think they work. I love vaccines. I will get a vaccine. As soon as a vaccine becomes available, I will get one because um, I feel like I'm in a slightly higher risk category for COVID than people on average. Um, but it should not be compulsory. I don't believe in compulsory medication of people. Um, so if you don't want to take it and... Um, you want to take your risks well that's up to you yeah and i agree totally with tim on this i mean you know um tim and i are both very interested in science i mean i actually have a background in science not not medicine uh, actually physics but um i'm probably one of the few people in the in the parliament that actually has any background in science but um you know like i think there's there there's definitely has been a lot of misinformation out there um what we've been upset with the government about, and especially from my office, because we've been asking about, you know, we get asked questions by the public about different drugs and trials and things like that. And we don't know the answers and we don't want to guess and just, you know, give them a link to a website or something. So we've asked the government and, you know, we've sent through questions to the health minister's office and they haven't replied. And we were happy to, you know, if there is trials, you know, because I heard the, that there is trials on ivermectin and some of these drugs in Victoria, um, I don't know the details of it, and that's what we were asking for. You know, what sort of information can we pass on to the public about this, what the government's actually doing? We're happy to pass on that information if the government provides it, but they haven't provided it. So, you know, it's just this really poor communication on this sort of thing. So, yeah, it's 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 not great. And, you know, lots of people think, you know, they read on a website somewhere that there's some, you know, magical cure or something, and then they think that the government's hiding it from them and... You know, it's it's really shambolic the way, you know, the government should be communicating, you know, here are all the things that we know about and here is the status, the scientific status of that. And because they're not communicating that, there's this big information vacuum. And, of course, the information vacuum gets filled up with the nonsense in that case because the government's not communicating it well. And that's exactly what's happened. You know, people just speculate about it. But, you know, there are trials of some of these drugs that are happening. So... You know, hopefully they will turn out to be, um, you know, effective. But you know, it doesn't know. I mean, you know, I've I've dealt a bit with the pharmaceuticals industry before, and I know that you know, you can't just just because you see in a small sample a drug has some effectiveness, that's not good enough for a doctor to go out and prescribe it. There has to be, you know, proper clinical random controlled trials and this sort of thing to prove safety and effectiveness. It does take time. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, you can't just rush out and start prescribing something because it sounds like it might be a good idea. That's not the way that science or medicine works. Let's have a look. Um, so one other question that I think might be an interesting one, just a real simple one. 
did the debate matter on Tuesday? You know, did it matter, the debate? Yes. Yes. Um, well, it mattered because people paid attention. People, people watched it, you know, like people were, I've never seen people take, pay so much attention to a, a upper house parliament session. Like it was just, people were tweeting about committee stage. I mean, that just never happened. Like live tweeting about committee and like commenting on MPs questions to the minister and stuff. So, you know, people were paying attention. And I, I think one, one really good thing that happened is because they were paying attention, they were watching what the government was doing and they're saying, what the hell are these guys doing? Like, this is wrong. Like, and they hear the way that the ministers ask, answer questions and stuff, and they're not happy about it. And I mean, that's good if they see that, see what's really going on. So I think the result was preordained um, before we walked in, into the chamber on Tuesday morning. Um, the government had the numbers and they were always going to get the bill passed. It wasn't going to change based on what people said there, but people put their opinions forward. And, um, I think one, the government got some got feedback that they haven't had before. Um, shocking as it was for them to think that they aren't, not everyone thinks they're right hundred percent. Um, but also for the people who are watching parliament for the first time. And I reckon a lot, I quite a big chunk of people had never, ever paid attention to politics, um, what was going on, how the parliament worked, um, had come engaged in the issue and seen how it works um, and know that they're not alone, that people um, share their views and that it wasn't a... The government didn't get a walkover win. They, they scraped it up by one vote. Um, so I think in, in most ways it, it does count. It, it did matter. It, it was important. Um, I mean, I'm in the office next, uh, the, the room next door to David, so I keep muting myself just in case we um, have some crossover. Um, so there was a, a couple of other questions. Um, one was, um, do you think that the Labor members are all as supportive of the Premier and the approach as, um, as it might look from the outside? Are, are they all 100% stand with Dan, do you think? I, I don't have insight into what's going on inside the Labor Party or no, not a lot. Um, I, I, if you ask me to guess, I'd say no. I reckon there's probably quite a, a swell of um, discontent and uh, anger at how the government's managed things, uh, but it's not coming out in public and it probably won't. Um, while the crisis is on, Dan Andrews will be firmly fixed in, in his job. No one, no one else wants it now while this is happening, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Dan resigns very soon after they declare victory on the on COVID. But when will that be? He's probably looking forward to the day he leaves, actually. Um, but yeah, I don't think Labor are firmly behind it at all, but the majority support it. And they, at this point, they're going, what else can we do? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um... It's difficult to tell, uh, you know, clearly they're not going to talk about it publicly and they're not going to talk about it to us. So, you know, we can only speculate. I, yeah, I couldn't really comment. I, I don't know. Like, the only thing that I do know is that uh, not many of them spoke in support of it, um, very small number. Now, that might have been just because they didn't want to use up too much time and have it go too late. I, I don't know why that was the case, but... Um, yeah, not a lot of them spoke in support of it, but who knows? I really don't know. There, there was a comment there. I, I'm not sure if you fully answered somebody's question, David, about being pro-choice when it comes to vaccines. So can you just get that on the record? I, I thought you did, but somebody seemed to think that you didn't. So, Yeah, no, I, I agree with Tim that, um, you know, I, I think that um, vaccines has have uh, been of great benefit to humanity. Um, I'm, I'm a big supporter of scientific research into medicines, including vaccines, but I don't support um, any sort of force uh, on, on people. Now, for certain jobs, maybe there's some sort of requirements or whatever, for, like for healthcare workers, we've discussed this before, maybe they, uh, you know, as a job requirement or something, but, you know, force, forcible medical procedures uh, were dead against that. So, yeah. Um, 
Did you have any dialogue with the three crossbenchers that supported the government's legislation to um, extend the emergency powers? Not really. Um, so I, I always expected uh, Andy Medic to support the government. Um, he, as far as I can tell, he's he never votes against the government unless it's something to do with animals. Um, he's like their he's like their special extra government member. Um, but uh, so, and he didn't see anything authoritarian that he didn't love the, the sound of. Um, Fiona. Uh, pattern of reason party claims to be a, a, a civil libertarian um, I don't know exactly how she can justify to herself this but but she did um, and Sam Ratnam from the Greens Sam has always projected herself as somebody who really cares about civil liberties as well and um, I was quite shocked that she actually brought herself back from maternity leave to support something which is the biggest boot on the neck of the Victorians um, that we've had this term or probably ever actually. Um, so I, I was amazed and shocked by her. Um, mm. I haven't spoken with her. Um, I'm a bit disgusted with, with uh, Fiona and Sam, to be honest. Um, we'll be, I'll be cordial again, but I won't be as friendly as I have been in the past. Yeah. It's just disappointing. I mean, uh, I, I don't know why they did what they did. Um, you know, Fiona at least was courageous enough to come out and, you know, say that she's going to do this. Um, but the Greens, uh, I thought what they did was um, cowardly. Like, they had no no stated position and then just come in and swoop in and save the government. I mean, yeah, that was really disappointing. Um, mm. I think it's blown holes in their credibility on civil liberty issues from now on. Um, yeah, I mean, they were so it, outspoken about the housing tower lockdowns and stuff like this, and then they come out and give the government the power to do it again. I mean, that just doesn't jive with with what they were saying. So, I don't know. I don't get it. No credibility. So I might just add to that just from a staffer's perspective. Like, I, there was a couple of um, sort of brief meetings with uh, other staff on the crossbench. So, they they, they let us know that they were negotiating. It wasn't something that was like snuck through. We, you know, the, the Liberal Democrats, David and Tim, weren't involved in those negotiations with the government. But, um, you know, they were kind of at least transparent with David's office and then letting us know what was going on and, and what they were proposing to the government. So just to kind of fully answer that, that question, I think. Well, they weren't that transparent. We got no idea what sort of deals were done. I mean, we have no idea. Oh yeah, no. And, I, and I mean, about the what was what what they were proposing should be included in the legislation was was um, you know they'd informed us ahead of time. We uh, hope that they they counted their thirty pieces of silver. <laughs> Short change. Um, I do on that point. We should probably note that um, ringing up and abusing uh, their staff at electoral offices is probably not a good idea. Um, they're more or less ordinary people just like ash um yeah they're, 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 don't don't harass their staff please as angry as you might be um maybe an email if you wanted to land for the mp because it's usually a staffer that answers the phone and they're just some poor schmuck like me yeah and this absolutely i mean there's we were you know tim and i are big believers in you know peaceful society we don't want to see anyone get um threatened or abused or anything like that so you know if you want to by all means engage with members of parliament and engage with officers and things like this but um i would urge people to you know be polite um you know firm, be firm with your beliefs but be polite don't abuse people um don't threaten people don't do anything like this don't say nasty things to people that are irrelevant i, I think it's important that um you know we maintain civility uh and yeah i, I I was disappointed to hear some of the things that um, Fiona said about, you know, she'd heard she'd gotten threats and nasty comments and things like this. And I, I don't like to see that, you know, I, I can disagree with someone and still be civil to them. And I would encourage everyone um, to do the same. 
Um, what else have we got here? I think we might have covered most of it. Um, let me just check my notes here. Uh, I think there was one about the, the curfew is under the state of disaster, and I, I think that's correct. That is correct. Yeah. So quick answer to that one. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about if there's any petitions to sign. I think you've sponsored at least one in the Legislative Council. Yeah, so I actually presented one this week. Um, I got a thousand signatures in like a couple of days. It was a very, very short-lived petition. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I have to go back and look at that because there were some other petitions as well. And I have, I've only sponsored one. Maybe there's another one. I think I got an email from someone that was requesting that I sponsor another petition. So for people that aren't aware, um, members of the public are allowed to set up their own e-petitions in the Legislative Council and um, then they can request that a member of parliament uh, sponsor that. Uh, now, what happens when that gets to parliament, it'll get presented to parliament and then members of parliament can speak to that petition. The government isn't actually forced to do anything with the petition, but it does provide a signal to the government that there is a certain amount of support for something. And it also gives an opportunity to speak to that issue. So, you know, it's not, it's not, um, you know, some magical thing that fixes everything, but it does provide an outlet, I suppose, for, you know, people to express themselves democratically. If we could get a petition up with 100,000 signatures or more, that would blow people's socks off. Yeah. Um, so there might be something that we're looking to doing in the, in the days to come. Just another way to protest without leaving your home. Um, to, if we can get a big number on it, um, it might scare the government just a little bit. Yeah, and we're happy to talk to people about that. If people are thinking about setting up a petition, um, you know, we can help, you know, we talk you through the process and what sort of things you probably shouldn't put on a petition and what things might be seen as reasonable or unreasonable or whatever. So, you know, we can probably help you with that if you call our office. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll maybe just quickly handle this one. Um, in terms of like signing a petition, it, it, there's no way to guarantee an outcome no. Um, before the next election or getting enough members of parliament to support an action in the parliament now. So it's not like there's some magical threshold where you get 200,000 signatures and then they have to do something. But it's a way of signalling that, um, you know, if there was 100,000 signatures on an e-petition, that would be, I think, more than 10 times the, the current highest number. So it's just another way of signalling to the government the level of... Um, angst and opposition to their current approach and you know these kinds of things like i it's hard to know but they 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 usually have an effect into playing into their decision making um uh how long can they extend the state of disaster for indefinitely yeah they have to um renew it but uh, there's no limit on the state of disaster. The state of disaster is a different set of powers under a different minister. It actually goes through the police minister. So it's quite different to the emergency powers under the Health and Wellbeing Act. And I'd argue it's an abuse of power to even use that for this crisis. They, yes. They've got the state of emergency for this. They should not never have gone to the state of disaster as well. Um, but Yeah. There's some things that the state of emergency, some powers that the state of emergency doesn't give them. Um, so the curfew is under the state of disaster and there's a few other things that have been happening under the state of disaster. Um, but we, we ne yeah. We've never declared a state of disaster or a state of emergency before. No, now, no, we declared, we declared a state of disaster at the start of the year. And the now fire. this year we've declared oh, right. it for the bushfires and one, once they open that can, they're now going back to it and back to it again. Um, so now they've, they've, they've opened Pandora's box and they're going to keep every time that something goes on, they'll say, oh, Emergency powers, yay. Um, I think it's a very, very dangerous step um, and we need to stuff it back in the box. Um, I was saying yesterday, I don't just... Uh, on Tuesday in the Parliament, I said, I don't just don't support the extension. I want to remove these powers now. I think you've demonstrated the government cannot be trusted with this power. Um, it's not democratic. Uh, it's, it's alien to um, our liberal democratic society and um, I think the powers have to be taken away from them. 
Yeah, look, it's it's uh, it's very disturbing to see how these powers have been used, and you know our expectations of what the government would do with these powers and what they've actually done were just like we never imagined when they you know we we're always critical of government, right? We we believe in freedom, but um, we never imagined that they would go this far with the emergency powers and the disaster powers. It's just it's just crazy what they've been doing, and um, you know we won't be supporting any more extensions. You know, we didn't support this extension from the start, but it's, uh, I don't know yet. Yeah, I agree with Tim. We have to put it back in its box. And look, one good thing about the one good concession that was made is that this extension is only related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the, their original proposal was to make these changes to the, to the um, emergency powers permanent. That means that not only this time, but every future government is going to have these powers, which uh, is totally unacceptable. So at least that's not going to happen. But um, yeah, it's still not great. So there were there are a few questions. I might just kind of answer uh, something that might be helpful for people because I've spent a lot of time on the phone this week in David's office, um, kind of explaining the process to people. Um, you know, what the difference is between the um, emergency powers, the disaster powers and, um, you know, some of those things. So it, I think it came up in the comments here in terms of what they've done in using the disaster powers. And this came through in, in some of the emails that, um, you know, some people thought that the, the document hadn't been tabled in terms of um, the disaster declaration and how the powers have been used. Um, it, it actually has, it might've been, you could argue it was tabled a day late or something, but it, it was tabled. You can find those documents. If you go on the parliament's website, click on the legislative council link and the tabled documents database. And, um, you can kind of read what, what their justification, they have to write their justification for using the powers and what powers they've exercised. And it's all there in that report for, for, some of the people that are kind of commenting and, and want to know a little bit more about it. Um, and, and it's the um, emergency management act that allows for the disaster declaration where it's the, whereas it's the um, public health and wellbeing act. That's the enabling act for the emergency powers. But if you, you know, if you want to know more about this, you can call up David's office myself or one of other David, one of David's other staff, we can, help explain this because I know for a lot of the people calling the office this week, it was the first time that paid this much attention to politics and, and the processes behind all of this. Um, so yeah, more than, more than welcome to keep calling. Uh, I've nearly lost my voice of being on the phone so much this week. Um, I think we've probably covered the main ground. There's, Maybe two other things. So um, one was the open letter from the doctors. A few people are asking about that. And a few people are asking about the, the draft plan that was leaked the other day. So if you have any thoughts about the doctor's letter and um, the draft plan and, and what you think will happen, you know, I guess uh, Sunday and, and from that. Uh, look, um, uh, there's a number of doctors that, are uh, coming out and disagreeing and, and not just doctors, scientists and economists and all sorts of people that are coming out and uh, disagreeing with what the government's doing. They're showing opposition to it. Um, the AMA has uh, you know been supporting the government, but clearly not. they don't represent all doctors um, because there's been a number of doctors that have come out in dissent. Um, so there's some lawyers as well that have come out with concerns about these powers and how they're being used. They're, they've got concerns about the proportionality of the responses that the government's taking. Um, very similar concerns to mine. So that's good to see that there is a growing uh, number of uh, professionals and experts who are um, expressing concerns. As for the plan, you know, there was that leaked plan. I don't know who leaked it or why they leaked it. Probably the government was kite flying to see what sort of reaction they get and then they can, you know, condition people's response for the weekend. I don't know. Tim probably has his thoughts on that, I guess. But uh, I, it might have been, I think it might have been a real leak, but yeah. Um, I, who knows? Um, yeah. They, they, they want to tell us as little as possible. It's, it's the, 
we're we're in charge. Just trust, sit back and trust us, and do nothing. We don't trust you anymore. So, yeah, I mean, why has it taken this long to come up with a plan? And like, you know, why couldn't they show it to us before the legislation? Like, you know, we might have been more open minded if they said, look. We just need another three months to do this and here's how we're going to get out of this and here's the end, here's what the end game looks like. You know, we would have been maybe willing to listen and at least, um, but, you know, there was none of that. So, yeah, nothing. All right, I think, um, I, I know there's more questions, but we did, uh, <laughs> I think uh, David, Tim and myself are all quite exhausted. Um, uh, any final thoughts, Tim? Um, I don't know. We, we're going to get through this um, sooner or later. Uh, the more pressure we can apply on the government, the better. Um, so some form of protest that isn't going to get um, everyone arrested or, or um, get people hurt would be nice um, to keep applying the pressure on them. Um, I really hope we don't slip into violence um, tomorrow or in the coming days. Um, the government could really work hard on toning things down instead of trying to amp up the, the aggro. Um, but um, so everyone stay calm, stay collected, stay focused. Um, let's continue to protest safely and um, someday this will end. Yeah, I mean, I, I concur with Tim. I mean, people need to try and I know that there's a lot of really strong feelings out there and I, I have strong feelings myself, but um, we need to stay calm and not do anything silly. I don't want to see anyone get hurt or arrested. Um, it's been um, sad enough already to see what's been happening. I don't want to see more of that. Um, this this is going to be a, a fight that's going to take a while. It's not just going to get solved instantly. So I don't think anyone should be um, uh, doing anything rash. I want people to stay calm. Um, let's look at what the government's proposing on Sunday. Let's scrutinize it um you know tim and i will be paying very close attention to what they're proposing um i'm sure we'll form our own views on that um and you know hopefully there's some good things in there but you know we want to see um freedoms return to victorians as soon as possible and we will continue to apply as much pressure in as many uh, ways as we can in a peaceful manner which um doesn't get people hurt uh that to try and get those freedoms turn, returned as soon as possible. So, you know, make some noise tomorrow night um, at 8 p.m., you know, bang your pots and pans. I'm going to be out there doing it. I'm, I'm really looking forward. I think the kids will love it. Uh, you know, get your kids involved, blow off a bit of steam. I think we all need to do that after this week. Um, watch what the government comes out with on Sunday. We'll be watching. I'm sure you guys will want to watch too. And um, let's listen to what they have to say. And, um, you know, maybe they might have listened a bit and seen the reaction and think, wow, maybe we need to work harder to return some of these freedoms. I know that's a very optimistic view. I always try and be optimistic, but we'll wait and see what they come up with. All right. Thanks, guys. I think we'll leave it there. Sorry if we didn't get to uh, any of your questions, but um, thanks for coming and uh, all of your comments, questions and uh, all of your calls and emails as well this week. Um, you know, I can sort of speak on behalf of David's team. We were really moved by um, a lot of your stories. They do matter. Um, you know, what you're going through matters. It's real. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be back with more soon. Uh, so thanks to our two Liberal Democrats members, David Limbrick, member for Southeast Metro Region, and Tim Quilty, the member for Northern Victoria. Thanks, everyone.